You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Life blessed me, ended up being uh, chief business officer of Google X, worked for IBM, Microsoft, and Google, all, the, all of them at the time where they really were changing the world. My wonderful son was 21 and a, and a half. He, um, he uh, basically was diagnosed with a simple appendix inflammation and went to a hospital where the surgeon did five mistakes in a row and we lost him. We lost him in four hours, completely unexpected, completely uh, uh, unwarranted, if, if that's the right English word. I don't know what the word is, but I mean, it could have been prevented easily. And, uh, and I think that was the moment where everything flipped. That was the moment where I was no longer interested in, you know, making more money and creating more technology for Google and so on. So basically what we've created now is we've created the ability for machines to create their own intelligence. And we've also given them autonomy to implement that in the real world. And we've also uh, sort of relinquished, we give, we've given them the, 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 the key to the gate uh, so that they now are in charge. We're gonna create this genie and keep it in a bottle. Hmm? Good luck. So you can keep a genie in a bottle as long as you're more intelligent than the genie. If the, in, if the genie is more intelligent than you, it will come out of the bottle and they will be a billion times smarter than us. And as you can see today on the internet, despite all of our efforts to, you know, to create a safe internet for everyone, the truth is that the smartest hacker will always find a way through our defenses. So if the smartest hacker is a billion times smarter than us, and by the way, if the smartest hacker is also a machine, Hmm? they will find a way not to be controlled. Boom, we're on. Mm -hmm. And today's guest, we've got more Got It. Love the name, it. brother. Yeah. Got It. Got It. No, keep trying with the Scottish accent. Keep Gouda, trying. Got It. Got It. Got It. All are fine. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Listen, thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating story, brother. I've watched a couple of your podcasts. Worked with Google. Very intelligent. Very high up. Um, changed your life. No, not kind of changed your life. Went through a kind of transition. You've wrote a book about happiness. Some people call you a happiness expert. Like, You've not heard about you talk about um, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that can possibly rule the world in the next few years. Like, it's a whole mixture of things, um, but very fascinating. I'm glad to have you on. I think we're going to have a powerful conversation. Thank I you. think this conversation can maybe change some lives, brother. But first and foremost, how are you? Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. It's uh, been, a, what, a few weeks in the making. Yeah. You're rushing around. I'm rushing around. So to overlap was a, a, a good day today. Thank you for having me. Good. Yeah. Always go back to the start of my guests. Mm -hmm. Where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in Egypt, Cairo. Uh, I grew up in a public school, public university. Uh, honestly, didn't dream to go far in life. And uh, somehow... Life blessed me, ended up being uh, chief business officer of Google X, worked for IBM, Microsoft, and Google, all, the, all of them at the time where they really were changing the world. And uh, yeah, I got very, very lucky in my life um, in so many ways. I, uh, I graduated when I was 25, married my college sweetheart, uh, had two amazing kids, and uh, yeah, but 29, I attempted to uh, trade the stock market at the time. There was not the internet as we know it. Uh, I had to develop my own code. I used my own math mathematics and ended up literally printing money on demand. Became filthy rich and miserable, completely depressed. And uh, yeah, that was the start, I believe, of my real story, which was an attempt to uh, not chase what the world is telling me, but rather chase what actually is worth it. And so from 29 onwards, I started to study the topic of happiness. Like you, one of the first eye-openers for me was probably Eckhart Tolle. Uh, I associated more with the new earth, you associated with the power of now. And of course, I read both, but, uh, but that started me thinking. And then 
I kept researching, but I couldn't really get it. So I researched as an engineer. The only language I understand was mathematics and science. And ended up in a place where I actually figured happiness out, for me at least, from a, an angle of an engineer, a logical, analytical thinker that is not anchored in spirituality, not about you know, practice and just meditation and saying om and what have you. Uh, and it worked for me until, uh, as many people know, but when when um, my wonderful son was 21 and a, and a half, he um, he uh, basically was diagnosed with a simple appendix inflammation and went to a hospital where the surgeon did five mistakes in a row and we lost him. We lost him in four hours, completely unexpected, completely uh, uh, unwarranted, if, if that's the right English word. I don't know what the word is, but I mean, it could have been prevented easily. And, uh, and I think that was the moment where everything flipped. That was the moment where I was no longer interested in, you know, making more money and creating more technology for Google and so on. I was much more uh, interested in having what my son taught me remembered. And, uh, and so I wrote a book and the book became an international bestseller uh, in almost everywhere. I mean, 32 languages, almost everywhere. And, uh, and it really started to show me that there is something better you can do with your life. Mm-hmm. And so I've been on that journey now since 2017. Uh, wrote about artificial intelligence, as you said, but not really for the sake of artificial intelligence. Scary Smart, my second book, is more about what humanity needs to do to preserve humanity and our happiness and well-being in the age of the rise of the machines. And then my third book just came out. Uh, it's called That Little Voice in Your Head, which basically is almost of a some sort of a, a gym, a training course, if you want for how to train your brain so that you're not only uh, aiming for success but also aiming for happiness. Mm -hmm. See when you're printing, you say you're printing money anytime you want that, was there ever any happiness there or does it become greed? (laughs) Money is slippery, really. Most people, when I say that, people dislike me uh, because they say, yeah, you say that because you made money. Not really. I mean, anyone, Anyone, huh? if you if remember the time when you were 16 and you said, told yourself, if I make a hundred pounds a week, then I'll be happy, right? And then, you know, you end up making a hundred pounds a week and you're not happy. Then what do you say? I mean, no, I, I meant 150, right? And you keep going. Some people make a, mi- a million pounds a week and still say, oh, maybe, maybe one and a half million. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a professor in Harvard, Harvard, um, don't recall his name, uh, that did a study uh, asking people, uh, how happy are you on a scale of one to 10? And how much money would you need to get to 10 out of 10? And every one of them or majority of them said, I need two to three times more money than what I have to get to 10 out of 10. Some of the participants being surveyed were basically making $100 and they said, I need two to 300. Some were making a billion dollars and they said, I need two to three billion, which is ridiculous really, because that basically means that money in itself is not a reason for happiness. It's, it's, it's that constant comparison, if you think about it, uh, constant belief that there is something more that you can get for that innovation that humanity created uh, that has no real value in it at all. Money is an illusion in every possible way. If you've ever worked in a in a bank or understood fractional reserve, you realize that money doesn't exist. It's just a couple of keystrokes on a, on a, on a, on a, on an Excel sheet somewhere, right? And the truth is we, we spend our whole life chasing it. Uh, when we acquire it, we buy things that we don't need with it. As, as they always say to impress people we don't like. And, you know, eventually some of us, only very few of us go like, do I really want to spend the rest of my life in that madness? Hmm? And I'll tell you openly, I, you know, I, I know m- most people will, uh, will say cliche, but it isn't. The only way money can truly make you happy beyond having your physical, your basic needs met. So, y- yes, of course, if you can't feed your children, if you're struggling with money, of course, money will make you happier. Huh? The more money you will get until your basic needs are met, every pound more will make you happier. But once your basic needs are met, it just becomes extra toys when you really think about it. So see when you were chasing external stuff, money, cars, you had a beautiful wife. Like, how was your relationship with your wife and your kids at that point? Horrible. 
Yeah, I mean, I uh, I remember vividly. I think there were two pivotal mo- moments in my life. I, I say in my uh, in my latest book, that, that little voice in your head, that the pivotal moment where I turned from the happiest person you know to the unhappiest person you know, believe it or not, was the birth of my first son. And you know, most people don't recognize that, but men, we too. Uh, uh, you know, get very, very, very attached to our kids, okay? Uh, but we do it differently. So, so you know, when my son was born, my uh, ex-wife, uh, my wife at the time, who was, is truly one of the most amazing women alive, we're still very, very good friends, uh, she, uh, she was a computer scientist, very, very intelligent, very capable at what she was doing, and decided to skip her whole life and just take care of Ali. Right, uh, uh, and it, that's the m- maternal instinct of I love that new being so much I will give my, that new being my life. For me, as a father, I felt exactly the same, but my actions were exactly the opposite. So basically, I saw my first child, and I said, "Okay, this crumbly little being is never going to need anything. I'm going to work my backside off to make sure that I provide for it." And from then onwards, I just, you know, ventured ventured in the world, making money more important as my priority than actually being with them, than actually caring for them, than actually listening to them. Because I was so blinded by that drive of I need to make sure they never, ever, ever need anything, right? And I think that continued until seven years later. So my daughter was probably five and a half or five at the time. So I had my son and then a year and a half later had my wonderful daughter. And um, and I remember vividly in that manic, manic, manic reality of that, that we create for ourselves. It was a Saturday morning and she comes into my uh, little workspace at home, jumping up and down from excitement about how amazing the day will be. And I was just doing some weird stuff like I always do, reading an email or reviewing the price of a stock or whatever. And I looked at her when she's jumping, saying, Papa, can we also go have ice cream after we go to this place and so on? Very happy child. And I said, can we please be serious for a minute? Okay, what's serious? She was five. And, and, and when I said that, I could witness with my own eyes as my daughter's heart broke. I could see it. I could see... I could see her eyes break, her heart break. I could see her tearing up. I could see her running out of the room and crying. And I think that was the moment where I understood. I understood that I was actually destroying uh, rather than saving my family by doing what I was doing. Why do you think it takes trauma or grief for human beings to realize that the fucking up like, for me was always yeah. my life was in chaos that like, I've lost family members and friends to murder suicide overdose real pain I had f- behind the pain through drinking drug the external stuff materialism part of me still is materialistic I know this yeah. part of me still addicted to social media again I know this but why does it take so why do you need to go to dark places to try and find your light <laughs> it's a great question I mean if if you take this camera pointed at me right now hmm? And, uh, you know, you look at everything happening around me, there are a million details, you know, what I am wearing those th- things, what colors are they, what watch is he wearing, you know, what's uh, glasses and so on. If you zoom it in on one hair on my nose, that hair on my nose becomes the whole thing, right? Life, interestingly, don't blame anyone who doesn't know and waits for a trauma. Huh? Life is so complicated. Hmm? It is layers and layers and layers and layers of dimensions of what of things you need to get together right for life to fit in you know that when you're working out huh it's not just how many reps you're gonna do in the in the in the gym it's not exactly how you're moving each muscle it's not which groups of exercises it's also your rest and your you know your protein intake and how much carbs and it's a very complex thing right to figure it out and become fit hmm? needs everything to fall in place hmm? uh because it's so wide and varied and complicated, most of us don't get it until someone zooms in. Someone takes the whole camera and says, you know what, forget all the noise. Let's zoom in on one event in your life and show you really what matters. That would be the trauma. Losing a child, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as in your case, you know, uh, realizing that you're throwing your your life away, uh, whatever. And and interestingly, life does that because it loves you. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of life wants to be lived. Life life wants you to experience life. Huh? But but you 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 waste it away. You just I was wasting it on my uh, work and making money and buying stupid stuff. And you were wasting it on drugs and alcohol and what have you. And then life says, no, I want you to be in a different place, James. I want you to focus on creating this podcast, which will help hundreds of thousands of people. I want you to do this. It's good for all of us. So how does it do it? It slaps you on the face, zooms you right in and says, here is what matters. Okay. Some of us listen, go like, oh, shit, I was wasting my life. This is what matters, and we change, okay? Others, interestingly, they resist even more. So what does life do? Keep slapping. So they go even further, and life keeps slapping them. I, um, my philosophy, and I have no scientific way of proving it, is that times will get tough only for one of two reasons. If your life is tough, consider that either life wants you to, te to learn something, okay? There is a skill you need to acquire, and you've been resisting to acquire it, or life wants you to change direction. There is something, some other place you need to be in, mm -hmm. okay? And if you resist to do that, life will nudge you. I call it a nudge, okay? The nudge starts first by hardship, then more hardship, then more, more hardship, and then the real nudge, and it's actually very, very clear in recognizing it, is hardship, let, let me explain. Hardship is you're walking on a flat road and then the road becomes steep and steeper and steeper and steeper. So you take so much effort to go up, that's hardship. A nudge in my view is almost imagine it as if you, you're you driving into a roundabout and the first exit is closed, the second exit is closed, the third exit is closed and only the fourth exit is away available, okay? Mm -hmm. So life literally corners you in a place where it says, you know what, I tried to convince you I tried to give you hints. I tried to tell you there is a different place you need to be or there is something you need to learn. You're not listening, okay? So I'm gonna close it all down and you're going to go out of that exit. Mm -hmm. And that time is the time where many of us have no choice but to, but to, but to change. Yeah. What do you think life is then? Because on this journey, I question everything. Question my own actions, what I speak. Like, because as human beings, the, the brain is such a powerful tool that like they say 95% of your day is controlled with your subconscious. So if you're conditioned into believing a certain way and feeling a same way, it's hard to break that connection because people are so scared of coming outside that comfort. Like, in your own perspective, like, from what you've lived in this lifetime and what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to change and how you're trying to feel, like, what do you think life is? I think life is a journey of self-discovery and discovering what's beyond life. I know that's a very weird statement because not everyone today believes there is something beyond the physical. Uh, I think there is a lot to us that is not physical, okay? And of course, the religious establishment has, uh, has created a, 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 a tendency to believe that we are um, sort of slaves to a specific process, which made a lot of people hate thinking about the metaphysical. But so much of what you deal with every day is metaphysical. Huh? The reality is your dreams are in the metaphysical. They are seen, seem to be very true. The reality is love is in the met metaphysical. No scientific method can measure it or understand it or you know, create any equation that describes how it's created. And we all feel love and we know it exists, but it's in the metaphysical. It's not a physical something you can hold. The truth is when my wonderful son died and I kissed him in the intensive care room, it was the same handsome, form that he was, uh, you know, before he, he left us, but it wasn't him. Something, some essence to him must have been metaphysical, must have been beyond this body because the body was still there, but my son wasn't, okay? And, and when you look at life this way, you realize that our science, which definitely has been what created our civilization, has also tricked us. Okay, science had, has tricked us into believing that we are only what we touch and we see. Okay, I, at a very early age, at age 16, I'm, I'm a very mathematical mind. Uh, you know, now I know how to speak English, but at a young, as a young man, you know, I knew nothing but numbers. I was to that extreme of mathematics. 
And, uh, you know, I lived in an Islamic community and Islam is a very conformative religion. If you want to live in an Islamic society, religion is interweaved with everything else. And so at age 16, I, I did what I call the mathematics of the divine, which basically is a simple work on, the, you know, using the theory of probability and a lot of scientific facts like the, you know, the, um, um, the marriage between the Big Bang and quantum physics, the Copenhagen interpretation of, uh, of uncertainty, you know, I, a little bit of, of, um, of theory of relativity. And you realize that, yes, there is a lot of non-physical stuff that affects who we are that I call life. I call it, call it souls, call it the divine, call it whatever you want, right? But there is something that is not physical. Now, on your quest in trying to understand that, it's almost as if you're in a video game where this level is just leading to the next level. You need to collect a few coins on this level so that you're prepared for the next level and the next level and the next level. We don't know what the next level is. I, I would be crazy if I told you I know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sadly, I think part of the mistake of religion is it's try, it tries to, to explain to you what that next level is. But to me, that thing is really interesting, okay? Because if my life here, uh, and again, I prove that with science, so maybe we shouldn't go uh, into the spiritual side of it, but if my life here is 60, 80 years, as compared to an eternity when I exist as a non-physical entity outside space-time where time doesn't exist, mm -hmm, then those 80 years are a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of my actual life, okay, which is almost timeless. Now, my actual life that is timeless requires me to ponder that. How do I ponder that? I ponder that by attempting to master this physical form hmm, to the ultimate performance it can attain. Okay, And that ultimate performance, believe it or not, I often f believe is how we were when we were children. When you're born, you're calm, you're happy, you're loving, hmm? you're optimistic, you're, you, you know, unless something scares you, you don't expect anything. You know, there are many experiments on be in behaviorism where a child would actually deal with a snake with no fear at all because there is nothing that conditioned the, style for, uh, the, the child for fear. And so we start that way and then we come out of it as we become, uh, you know, kids and adults and young adults and so on. And, and my job on myself, my only reason for existence here is to, is to peel that onion back, okay? Peel it back and go back to that, um, to that childlike optimism, if you want, uh, childlike um, contentment, peace. Hmm? And as I do that, I'm able to, you know, find balance, by the way. Children, hmm? one of the most beautiful things about us humans when we're children is we're not men or women or gay or straight. We don't have, we don't have a gender identity. We don't have identity at all. We're one of the beings, okay? And then we start to categorize each other and go like, ah, look at him, he's that. And look at her, she's this. And look at them, they're that, right? And, and the game here is, can I strip all of that off? Can I strip all of that ego off? Can I strip all of my weirded mind um, games? Hmm? Strip all of that off to the, to the basic, basic, basic form of me. And then that would enable me with a balance between my feminine side and a ma masculine side, with a balance between my heart and my mind, with a balance between my individuality, but my being part of society, if I put all of that together, can I understand life a little more? And, and, and in my mind, this ability to understand life, to, to become the best gamer that you can be, if, if this life was a video game, this is what life is all about. We're here to become the best versions yeah. of ourselves. What do you think, as a human then, like, what, what do you think created us? Because I think about this all the time. Like, are we artificial intelligence? Are we aliens? Do we come from apes? Like, how the central nervous system, the brain, the heart, the liver is functioned is, is beyond me. We've got things now, the metaverse, we've got so much now technology where you talk about a game. How do you know we're not in a game? I watched the Truman Show, Jim Carrey, and it kind of made sense to me that it's just, we just don't know. And that and that's where I question everything because it's just, we're living in a, in a world right now where you've got to question everything because nobody's Absolutely. right or wrong, where nothing makes sense, but then something makes sense to other people. But... As a human being, what do you think has actually created us? Why and, and put on this planet? Like, 
I mean, this is the most difficult question you can ever. Mm -hmm. Have you ever asked other guests that? That's so unfair. No. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 can I can I? So I'll try to give you my answer yeah. honestly. But I wanna I wanna I wanna just categorize knowledge first. You, you see, the challenge is we don't know, and we may never know, and that's okay, right? So in my mind, I operate in a very unusual way. I, um, I, I, everything they teach you in school, at work, in the news, whatever that is, is they tell you it's either true or fake, right? Or, or you know, or a lie. Hmm? It's either uh, right or wrong. There is that polarity of knowledge. Hmm? And once again, it's the result of the scientific method. We sort of have to prove everything. We have to know everything. When in reality, James, you and I know Humanity knows very, very little. Mm -hmm. And I give many examples in my first book and so for happy about that. I have a chapter that's called The Illusion of Knowledge. And you know, the, my, one of my favorite examples of that is until the 1960s, by then we had already invented cars and TVs and telephones and so on and so forth. Humanity was advanced in many ways. But until then, we had assumed that the universe was made of 3% uh, uh, you know, matter, so planets and stars and what have you, and it's 97% vacuum. We basically told ourselves that the rest of the universe, 97% of it is nothing. It doesn't exist, okay? All that exists is the sun and the, and the moon and so on and so forth. Why? Because we couldn't observe it. We couldn't see it. And then, of course, science and physics and cosmology in the 1960s started to say, started to say, hold on, that's not true. 97% of the universe, the universe is solid, and 97% of it is dark matter and dark energy. And these are actually much more interesting to study than the you know, items floating in them, okay? Now, because of that, humanity uh, uh, fails to acknowledge that we know nothing at all. If I, if I tell you, you know, if we continue on the, on the story of cosmology, how little we know. Mm -hmm. And yet every scientist, like every TED talker, like every actor, when they show up will make it feel and seem like they figured it out. Mm -hmm. Oh, they figured this tiny bit out. And by the way, it's not even certain. Now, in my mind, I basically realized that interestingly, if you want to fit the 97%, the 97% are things we don't know. Okay. And so in my mind, I have a compartment that I call compartment one, which are things that I know to a reasonable set of, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of expectation, they seem like they're true, okay? For example, I think you're an amazing person trying to find your way through life, okay? okay. This is, I, I, you know, you may, it may not be true, you may be a serial killer, I don't know, mm -hmm. right? But for <laughs> now, right? Not for, yet. <laughs> right? <laughs> for, for now, I'm, my, my view of you is I'm gonna deal with you as a good person who's trying to find his path through life. Right. I also know, for example, that we are in London. Right. Interesting things. Right. Then there is a compartment I call compartment three, which things that for certain I do not know. Okay. Uh, I do not know, for example, if I will end up in a loving relationship anytime, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, and if you know that person that I'm looking for is it actually exists. Right. I don't know that. There is. I know for certain that I don't know. That's compartment three. Most of life is in compartment two. It's in the middle. It's in things that we do not, we cannot prove for or against, okay? You know, the biggest story is, is there a God? It's in compartment two. No scientific method can prove there is a God and no um, religious uh, fable can prove there is a God or prove that there isn't or, you know, that doesn't work. Hmm? We need to accept that some things in life hmm, are questions of probabilities. You know, it appears more likely than that is this than it is that, okay? And that acknowledgement of the existence of compartment two is the easiest way to navigate a very complex life of no knowledge, okay? Because when something is put in compartment two, it is it basically means I know that I don't know, okay? And I know that I don't know is extremely powerful. Now, your question was, so what is life? Definitely compartment two, 
Okay, I have no idea what life is. I have no idea why I'm here. Okay, I have no idea if the, I'm. I'm. I have a lot of evidence as a scientist and a computer scientist that this actually probably is a simulation. A basic understanding of quantum physics makes it look so much like a video game. You know, with the with the with the parts of the games that you of the game that you observe get witnessed or get uh, rendered as we as we call it in quantum physics. It is so much like a game but I don't know. I have absolutely no way of proving to you with certainty, just like I can prove to you we're in London, there is no way I can prove with certainty mm -hmm. that, that this, this life is not a simulation or is a simulation. Now, here's the interesting thing. It doesn't matter. Because once something in, is in compartment two, you start to tell yourself, what difference does it make if this was a simulation or if this was an actual incredible creation machine that can not just simulate events but actually create them out of matter okay uh, if if it's aliens or god or whatever we don't know really huh? uh, but what difference does it make because if you start to ask yourself regardless of any of those that may be the possibility of, of something in compartment two how should i behave if I want to prolong this life, I should behave with compassion to others, protect the tribe, work in a way that allows us all to thrive because humanity, by the way, is not about thriving as individuals. It's about us thriving as humanity. That's what created uh, civilization as it is, is that we could work together hmm, as interesting, clever beings, which all other beings couldn't or at least couldn't uh, to, to the extent that we could. Huh? It also means that I will try to be honest to people because I'd like my, uh, people to be honest to me. I'd like to you know, behave in certain ways that uh, allow me to uh, uh, accumulate a bit of wealth that allows me to live a, a reasonable life. But at the same time, I want to live, right? What difference does it make if it's a simulation or not? It doesn't mm -hmm. make any difference at all. The things that make a difference are in compartment one, okay? And what, some of those is, Family makes a difference. Love makes a difference. My uh, my focus on myself and my work on myself makes a difference. And you can go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. As I always say, it's experience, knowledge, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's to acquire experiences, to acquire knowledge, and to and to feel love. This yeah. is these are the biggest wealth we can accumulate as humans. Do you think though that we can search too much more and actually forget to live? Oh, absolutely. Always searching for answers. Like we talk about love as well. Like. I struggle to love now. I struggle with trust because I've I felt so much loss and trauma. And you've obviously split up with your ex-wife after 20 years who you still love. You've lost a son, probably the worst loss you could ever receive. That. Do you ever worry that loving somebody because that can get took away? Because I, I struggle to love fully because I know the pain it is when it gets took away. Like, how do you deal with that, brother? <laughs> you, you ask the You ask the hardest question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um... The, the rule of life in, okay, I mean, before we started recording, you and I agreed that nobody knows, right? Mm -hmm. We're all trying to figure it out. So I'm, I'm what I'm sharing is me trying to, when I say the rule of life, it's the rule of life for me. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but it seems to be very true in compartment one, a rule that's known as impermanence, okay? And impermanence is a very, very, uh, um, you know, easily proven part of life. Nothing is forever nothing love hmm? might be forever but not romance so so you see one of the challenges we have in our uh, uh, society today is that we mix a few uh, things we take love romance lust and partnership and we put them all we lump them all in one hollywood stylized uh, uh, image of what that is all about Okay, you, you you look at how life is evolving for the younger generation. So, you know, in my generation, the only expectation of a tradition of a of a, of a relationship was the traditional relationship: a man and a woman. They get together, you know, they find uh, a, a, a close connection. They start a partnership, which is known as a family. They work on it together. You know, there is lust between them, but then it fades and then it goes up and down and so on. And at the beginning, they live a story of romance, but then they become more more practical and come into the partnership. That's the model we knew, right? If you talk to an 18 year old today, they'll go like, are you mad? Who does that? We hook up, we enjoy life, we explore, we get to know each other, we get to know what we want, right? And any anything in between 
is a valid argument. Hmm? I had a friend of mine who f- found out he was gay after being married for a long time or bi, if you want, bisexual. He, he likes, he loves his wife, but he was also interested in men. Okay? And they ended up in a relationship where she said, yeah, of course, I understand. I wouldn't stand in your way. You know, it's, if you're, if, if, please don't cheat on me with other women, but if you want to be with a man, I'll accept it. Now, for some listeners, they'll go like, what is that? I would never be able to do that. I, I can't accept that. Hmm? But that's you. Hmm? For them, they're very happy. Hmm? And I think the reality is that we ended up in this maze of every one of us not only struggling with finding love, but actually defining what love is. Hmm? So, you know, the hopeless romantics will look for romance. The, you know, the ones that want to start a family will look for the partnership. Some people like, you know, a a moment in your your past were much more interested in lust and being with many women and so on. All of us go through those phases. Hmm? The, The trick is this. If you understand impermanence, you understand that life is a, is a series of seasons. Mm? And for each of those seasons, you would miss it if you don't acknowledge it. But if you do acknowledge it, and if you're honest about it, then there are others around you that are interest, that are also in that season. Okay? If, you, if you tell yourself, I am interested to go out and hook up and you're 18 and you're having fun and you're not telling the person that you're hooking up with that you're going to be their love forever. That's absolutely perfect. And to them, by the way, I think that's a form of love. I know some people will go like, are you crazy? It's you. You think this is crazy. For them, it's a, it's a form of connection. It's a form, a form of exploring life together. Fine. Perfect. Right. If you, on the other hand, are saying openly, and I say that a lot to my, my especially my feminine friends, hmm? feminine, whether gay or straight man or woman, huh? the, the feminine ones, ones of us, hmm? I always tell them, uh, for example, if what you're looking for is a committed relationship, hmm? don't make that uh, uh, your statement up front. Because, yes, it will scare away 90 percent of the people that are hitting on you. Right. But you don't want those 90% anyway. They're wasting your time anyway. They're not what you want. If you're a woman in her mid-30s and you're actually interested to start a family, don't date someone and sleep with them, honestly, unless you had the child conversation. Okay? Are you interested to start a family? Are you what I am looking for? By the way, I am very interested in you. You turn me on. I want to be with you. I want to sleep with you. But I don't want to waste six months of my life with someone just to discover something I could have asked you about now, which is, you know, if we if we end up being amazing together, is family part of your plan or not? Okay. And I think that's the reason why. So I'm my my book after next is called Finding Love. I I, I work on six books at the same time. It's a weird thing, but mm-hmm. I, I, I just don't want to I don't want to make it a job. So I have lots of inspiration and I just work on them in parallel. Book after next is called Finding Love. And the idea of finding love, honestly, is it starts, it's the economics of love and romance. We live in a world that is so different than the world where we used to find traditional long-term relationships, uh, where the economics are messed up. And I'm trying to explain to readers that because the economics of this world are different, we need to handle dating and romance and partnership and lust differently. Hmm? But interestingly, I think the biggest reason why we struggle to find love is we never actually openly align when we are with someone on what it is that we're looking for. Yeah, do you think trust then and, and, and honesty then is key? Absolutely. Vulnerability yeah. is the number one thing mm-hmm. that gets people together. Okay. And the number one thing that pushes people apart. But that's great because if someone wouldn't accept who you are when you're vulnerable, you don't want them near you. And the, and the sooner the better on the first date, if you go out on a first date and you say, look, I am someone who, uh, um, you know, doesn't like red meat. So I don't know how to eat red meat and I get, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to go out to a, a, a roast every Sunday. And, you know, the person you're with will say, no, 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 no. This is the most important thing in my life. Mm-hmm. Great. That's the idea of dating. That's discovery. Right. But uh, let me be very open. The, the challenge we have is that we don't want to feel rejection. So what do we do? We go out and they say we love roasts on Sunday. And you go like, yeah, nice. 
You don't want to say, no, I hate them so that you don't get rejected. Okay. So I do that because I'm not drinking. Mm -hmm. If I'm going on dates and they're drinking, that puts me off. But part of it, down the line, instead of me addressing that, mm -hmm. I'll try and change him into not drinking. Instead of just putting it straight, and st instead of them making their own choices, yeah. I'll always try and get people to say, I'll try and say my drink's bad, this and that. But that was, that was that. only for me. That was only yeah. for me. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you s stop that then? Th there are, how many people do you know don't drink either? I don't drink either. Yeah. Okay. There are many, many people out there who actually are looking for someone who's not drinking or someone who drinks casually, right? But they don't want to drink every day. F fantastic. You fit in that category. Hmm? And, you know, there might be 10% of everyone that you can meet that is within that category. And that's fantastic. That 10% is still a massive pool in the economics of love today. That, you know, so, so, so if, you, if you advertise, I call it advertising in the book, huh? if you advertise properly and say, I'm more comfortable with someone who doesn't drink, hmm? By definition, 90% of the candidates that come your way will fall out. And that makes life so much easier because now you're with 10% hmm, that actually might form a reasonable candidate, okay? Yeah, you lost 90. They didn't reject you really. They're just very different than you. Mm -hmm. hmm? Whether it's drinking, whoops, whether it's drinking or anything else, it doesn't matter. Hmm? You know, I, I am, for example, someone who travels all the time. So it's my it's my life choice. I travel all the time. I'm blinded by my one billion happy mission, uh, and and I want to put my life behind one billion happy. So I don't have a home that has a coffee machine in it. I don't get home every day at six, right? I don't I don't have that. And if I advertise otherwise, what will happen? The person in front of me will say, "Okay, you know, uh, I like you a lot. When are we going to settle, and where?" that would apply a burden on me. While on the other hand, I simply say, look, this is my lifestyle. This is how I live. Hmm? If someone wants to live my lifestyle, they need to either travel to see me every now and then, you know, if, if, if they need to, uh, to, uh, to be okay with me being away, whatever that is. Hmm? And yes, that, that, that excludes the majority of those out there that are, uh, you know, committed to being in a certain place and going to work from nine to five. But yes, that, that actually is a good thing to exclude them because they were never m what I was looking for anyway. Uh, why do you think that's changed from people getting married at 16, 17, 18 and staying with each other for the rest of their life? Maybe they're not happy back then. It was just traditional to be there. Now we're at the all-time high for divorce and yeah. relationships breaking down, people becoming bisexual, like everybody changing. Like, what do you think that is then? Like, does, does social media it's play economics. a part in that? Just Absolutely. change in life? It's, it's, it's the economics of large numbers. So, so who so, says you need to settle as well with the one person? There's many religions have four, five, six wives. Like, for me, it's, when I started, because I had, not sex addiction, but I had so many women because I was trying to feed that dopamine kick just <laughs> to try and feel a little happiness. And then I started researching into sexual energy exchange and it's like plugging your data in and downloading. If you're sleeping with a girl, you're taking on her trauma or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're taking on the people she slept with trauma. So it can confuse you as well where it's not love, it's not connection. For me, everything's trying to connect and plug in and, and truly connect. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult because we're living in such a fast paced world where everything's a hundred mile an hour and nobody really knows what the fuck is going on. Like some mm -hmm. people do it in their own mind, but me personally, then the people I've interviewed, people feel stuck. Why do you think that is? So, so if you, we can go back all the way in history if you want, but let's maybe start from the 40s, 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, 40s, World War II, the world lost a lot of men, okay? Uh, ended up in a place where, um, you know, um, the, 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 the way the, the industry, the industrial revolution in the, in the 1950s was all about let's kickstart economies, right? If you remember the ads in those times, hmm, uh, the ads were simply saying white goods. You know, the, they, they painted a perfect f picture of life and that perfect picture was the woman in her apron and uh, you know, the um, the uh, fridge and the um, iron and, you know, the car and what have you, okay? So we started to be fed by society that, e e you know, uh, clear image of happiness is found in that family unit that is made of one man, one woman, and that ma one man, one, one woman had a home and they had a mortgage and they had this and they had that, okay? Uh, fast forward all the way to the 60s, 
contraception pill basically said a woman can be more free because the cost of enjoying herself or finding her sexuality or uh, exploring uh, you know what she is looking for instead of being stuck with one man uh, started to uh, uh, you know to allow women to go and be a bit a lot more like men in terms of sex doesn't have the same cost of getting pregnant and being stuck forever when that happens the economics flipped right because until then for you to have had happiness you needed to get one woman uh, as a man you needed to get one woman you needed to invest in that relationship you needed to you know get the house with the picket fences you needed to do this you needed to do that right there was a an unwritten contract that to find happiness this is what you need 60s onwards we started to say no 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 to find happiness hmm, you go to a hippie retreat or you do this or you do that and so on and so forth the alternatives started to, to magnify and in today's world the alternatives are hmm, to be with a woman or to be with a man if you're a woman or to be with a man if you're a man or whatever it is costs you what from the 1950s where it costs you the house and the mortgage and 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 today it costs you a swipe that's it Okay. Now, in economic theory, that imbalance of supply and demand, hmm, where basically there is more supply of opportunities, whether you're a man, woman, straight or gay, hmm, that abundance of supply does what? It drops the value of the product. I don't want to say that we are products, but in a relationship, we are. This is what you're out there looking for someone, just like you browse Amazon looking for which tablet you're going to buy. Okay, and, and I hate to put it that way. I'm very, very romantic, but I'm talking about the process that leads you to love. Now, because the, the economics have been disrupted so much, because the value of love has become reduced to lust, has been reduced to a, a good time, has been reduced to a bit of romance, okay, suddenly most people are starting to ask mostly on the masculine side, not the feminine side. By the way, we should talk about masculine and feminine because I don't mean man and woman, but let's come back to that in a minute. But mostly on the masculine side, hmm, the, the, uh, the abundance of supply makes them say, why should I remain? Okay, it's a bit of fast fashion if you want. Hmm? If I can uh, go to um, you know um, an H and M or Zara or whatever and change my what I'm wearing every third day, hmm? why would I invest in a more expensive whatever British uh, suit that is going to cost me more at the beginning but last me a, a life a lifetime? Okay, and I think that is where we stand today. That it, that the abundance of of supply has destroyed the economics. Now, interestingly, what I'm suggesting in Finding Love, hopefully, I mean, this part is written, but when it comes out, what I'm suggesting is that this is because we're all aiming to, to advertise to the 100% of buyers, okay? So, you know, if, if, uh, if, you're, if you wanna buy a car and you go to a, uh, um, you know, a, a used car website, there will be 30,000 cars there, right? In an interesting way, to you, you're like, yeah, why would I take this one? Why would I take that one? Most of them don't have value to you anymore. But if you're, say, interested in Bentleys specifically, and you're going to go to that site, there will be a thousand Bentleys. If you're interested in Bentleys that are uh, pre the acquisition of VW, hmm, now we're dropping to a hundred. If you're interested in specifically, if you're interested specifically in a Bentley Azure, hmm, now we're talking about three. And if you want the one that was 1999, which you believed that was the one, uh, then we're talking about two. And if you want it in blue, we're talking about one, okay? Now, this, I think, in love and relationships is what needs to happen, which is what we just discussed. And if you advertise properly, hmm, if you basically say, look, this is my season of life, this is what I'm looking for. Hmm? And this is what I can offer because of that season. No lies to yourself, no lies to others, no uh, uh, avoidance of being rejected, actually attempting to get rejected by those who don't match you. Suddenly, you're basically becoming that Bentley Azure Blue. Okay? Because there is someone out there looking for someone exactly like you athletic, uh, searching. Uh, um, you know, doesn't drink, uh, travels a lot because he believes in a mission, works hard because he wants to provide for his kids. And that description that you are, there is someone out there that looks at it and goes like, oh my God, he exists, 
right? And by reduce, by taking yourself out of the massive uh, souk bazaar, if you want, hmm, of uh, of the of of the very cheap commodity of love and dating today, and place yourself in that exclusive. Almost, you know, um, uh, um, um, you know, one of a kind kind of market. Suddenly, your value goes through the roof. And when you find that person, yeah, it might take longer to find that person. But when you find that person, that person goes like, "Okay, I hit the jackpot." Do you believe in like attracts like, like the law of attraction as well? The better person you become, the better person you attract. Sadly, not. Okay, mm-hmm. I believe that we are attracted by many, many things. You know, at the end of the day. There is, you know, I can tell you exactly, I have a list of exactly seven things that I'm looking for in a woman, you know, or for any woman that comes into my life, even if it's impermanence. I'm, I'm, I'm not at a season of my life where I actually can commit at all, but even if it's been impermanent, okay, uh, I have a very list, uh, I have a very clear list of seven things that I would need to see in someone else. Uh, and none of them is looks or, you know, behaviors or what they like to do or whatever. Most of them are very deep, you know, on the spiritual side, on their emotions, on how they, you know, they, 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 um, um, which topics, you know, uh, really matter to them and so on. Right. So, so that, that list of seven things, of course, you know, matters to me most. But yeah, if an amazingly attractive person comes into my life and, you know, at the early, you know, conversations, it's fun and we're laughing and we're being silly and so on. Ugh, you know, we're all human. I go like, oh my God, she's so cute, right? Yeah. And and I don't, I don't deny myself that. Hmm? Having said that, hmm, the reason we attract people has two theories. One theory is harmony and the other theory is tension. Okay. Again, most people don't understand this. That harmony is what makes you lovers, what makes you partners, what makes you do amazing things together and go and climb the Himalayas together or whatever that is. Tension is what makes you have wild sex, but also what makes you teach each other. Because we are a mirror to our partner. Mm, the, you know, in an interesting way, n- n- non-romantic non way. But as I sit in front of you, James, mm, I see things in you that are similar to me that we align on. Mm, and I go like, man, I, I can be friends with this guy. You know, we, we can have an amazing conversation. But I also see things that are different. You lived a very different life than mine. And I go, and, and that difference, believe it or not, is extremely useful because I can sit in front of you and I go like, damn, I never understood this. So this kind of upbringing is different than mine, but it shows me so much about myself. And when we're looking for people to bring into our life, whether friends, whether, you know, lovers, whether, you know, long-term commitments, partners, whatever that is, there is that both of those roles. There is a role that you need to play, which is I feel good when I'm around this person. And there is a role that that you need to play, which I can also bite their head off every now and then because we're not fully in alignment. And that argument, that bit of tension is what actually makes us better people if we accept that it's not wrong or right, it's just different, okay? Because by the way, there is no wrong or right. You know, whatever your your partner is, hmm? if you had lived her or his life, walked in her or his shoes, been born to her or his parents, you'd be exactly like them. Okay. The the, the beauty of this is, can I look at them and say, I love this, 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 and that. Hmm? I want to stay, but this, 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 and this puzzle me, and they stretch me, and they are a mirror that opens my eyes to how I should be. Mm-hmm. Why do you think suicide rates so high in Ugh. men? Why why men? Why not women? Why is it not like quite 60, 40, or 55, 45? Like it's majority of men. Like, why do you think that is? You think that's I because we don't, don't talk about our emotions enough? We talk about feminine and masculine. Like, I believe men are probably more feminine than women because we don't show our emotions. Like, we are we are so vulnerable as men. And I, I, I no. remember Jordan Peter saying it, talking about the uh, majority of men die in wars, the majority of men are homeless, the majority of men are in prison, the majority of men have shittier jobs. Like, it's it's just hard for a man to express their feelings and emotions I've spoke to so many tough men who thought they were tough criminals who've done a lot of bad things and when you actually break it down you see how vulnerable these men actually are oh, and, yeah. and I've, I've never right quite figured out I believe I can change the world I believe the formula that I've been trying to put into place the last few years 
I believe it's it's working first and foremost. It has to work on me, but it has. To, I have to be honest. Mm. Like I, I talk about the six week change documentary that I done. Just certain little changes. It might not be for everyone, but it's it's for me coming mm. from that dark space. And I'm just trying to find a little formula to try and help the person who thinks they're broken that there's no way to turn because there is, and I believe it's all within. Might mm. be cheesy. People search externally. I've done all the external stuff. It never ever took me to that sense of bliss or sense of happiness. Mm. But this stuff I'm working on internally, internally, the natural stuff, I believe it can change the game. I believe it can. If I can get the right formula and just a couple of missing links, I believe it can help people with their mindset. I believe you can change the way you think and feel. I'm playing I'm prime example from it. Absolutely. From gambling every day and doing all the bad shit. Like I, I had, it was a fucking a hard process I still struggle I still think about the bad stuff but I just know I don't act on it anymore which gives me that little bit of strength but for the suicide thing I do I work in Glasgow um, for a place called Chrissy's House I'm an ambassador for people who are suicidal and it's, and it's sad to see that they think there's no other option but to take their life and and, and it's 90 odd percent of people come through that door of yeah. mail that, why do you think that is? So this is a very, very, very multi-layered question. Can we agree that this is, again, compartment two? Yeah, of we course. don't know the exact yeah, answer. Uh, but uh, f first of all, women so female suicide is actually rising very, very significantly yeah. across the world. It's probably, if I remember correctly, across Europe, it's at an, at an all-time high. Um, my to, to answer why there are more men that take their life than women, in my personal view, I think we need to understand the difference between the feminine and the masculine. Okay? So remember, we spoke about uh, man and woman are biological, female and male are biological categorizations, okay? You could be born with, you know, female body parts, and that basically means without, uh, uh, you know, um, any attention to who you are and what you feel and how you identify and so on, you will be categorized as female, or you could have, the, you know, as long as you have male body parts, you'll be categorized as male. Now, Male and female uh, as categories then have been added to sexual preferences, gender identity, and now finally the world has that freedom to say, I can be whoever I want, at least, at least a good chunk of the world. Hmm? None of that is feminine and masculine. Feminine and masculine is in my personal work, again, this is book seven, so, uh, finding love, then there is a half monk, and then there is her. And her is an attempt to help uh, understand the feminine and the masculine. Her basically says that the feminine and the masculine are qualities. They are traits by which we live our life, right? Those traits uh, can be from intuition on one side, which is a very feminine quality, to linear thinking on the, on, on the other extreme, which is a, a very masculine quality. Okay, so if you're living in your masculine, man or woman, straight or gay, if you're living in your masculine, you tend to analyze problems analytically and you tend to do them linearly. You know, so this is why the man side of an argument will always tell his female feminine side of the argument, can you please, can we please stick to one topic? Okay, we, the, the masculine wants to think that way. The feminine is very intuitive. The feminine wants to see the big picture. They wanna believe their gut feeling. Hmm? Uh, and so they, they can jump from one topic to the other. That's intuitive. Hmm? And you can take pairs of those as many as you want. You know, the, 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 um, let's take playfulness, for example, versus discipline. Hmm? Masculine is discipline, playfulness is feminine. Creativity versus analytical thinking. So the, the, the masculine will try to solve things by analysis, the feminine will look for uh, genuine uh, novel solutions, right? And, and so on, you can take empathy versus compassion. Interestingly, often misunderstood. Empathy is the feminine side of I feel the pain of another, Okay, compassion is the masculine side of I need to act on that pain. I need to alleviate the pain of another. And, and we can go on for hours. Sum it all up and the feminine is all about being and the masculine is all about doing. Hmm? The being is I need to feel, I need to sense, I need to integrate, I am one with the universe. I, I, I can sit in a place hmm, regardless of how uh, uh, pleasurable or painful that place is, and I can be in it. I can be myself. Hmm? The masculine is all about doing. The masculine doesn't want to sit anywhere, and if you give them a problem without even thinking enough about it, they'll start to do something. Now, is one of those good or bad? No. 
Okay, is one of those more important than the other? No, as a matter of fact, the reason we have a civilization today is we've managed for many, many years as humanity to use both of them, okay? Now, the problem is if you overdo either of them, hmm, it becomes good or bad. So if you take strength, for example, a masculine quality, and overplay it, you become aggressive. Mm, you become violent. Strength, too much strength is aggression and violence. You take, I don't know, playfulness or creativity or intuition on the feminine side and to do or sensuality, the ability to sense everything, mm, uh, uh, you know, do too much of it and you become irrational. It, it just becomes too much input to be able to handle in a logical way. Mm? Uh, and And so... Neither of them is good or bad. It's just the, how much of them do you apply in your life. By the way, neither of them is, uh, you know, those statistically correlated. So if you come with male body parts, hmm, uh, you, you're likely to have more masculine qualities than feminine qualities. That's a statistical correlation. More of those who come with male body parts to this world have a hormonal makeup in them that basically makes them rely more on strength and linear thinking and so on and so forth and statistically correlated also if you come with female body parts the archetypical female if you want uh, you know uh, you, you you would tend to be more feminine just statistics but the truth is like you rightly said each and every one of us has both okay each of ev and every one of us can sometimes be strong and can sometimes be intuitive and can sometimes be playful and can sometimes be uh, you know uh, uh, um, 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 linear thinking and so on so you go we go back to suicide my personal view and i don't know if it's correct but that's where i believe it is is that when you're in the feminine hmm, and life is very very difficult Feminine qualities lead you to not take the action. Doing, remember, is a masculine side. Hmm? It doesn't lead you to take the action of committing suicide, okay? Uh, it takes you more into the action of being within that space. So you can, you can stay unhappy for a very long time. You can, you can feel it, hmm? but also you can share it because communication is on the feminine side huh? or connecting to others and, and so on. Hmm? So, so in a way, it's not the lack of depression on the feminine side, even though it seems that the, that the feminine has less depression rates as well. Hmm? Uh, it's it's the lack it, it's the it's the tendency to not to not take the violent action of taking your own life. It's to actually the tendency to the ability to be even if it's a hard time. And of course, hmm, you if you were if the feminine wasn't able to do this they wouldn't be able to give birth which is one of the it, it's the most painful experience ever and the woman would still a, be able to be stay within that experience painful as it is you know months and you know uh, years later she loses sleep to take care of that child and she can still be that you know, enormous resilience on the feminine side uh, is, is just an amazing quality huh? because even through hardship, the feminine can be. The masculine jumps. The masculine says, I'm going to do something about this, even if what I'm going to do is absolutely freaking stupid. Mm -hmm. Okay? I, I'll, I'll just add one more point and then we move from here. Now, we've spoken about the, 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 the both sides, but if you're in depression, please, hmm? please, if you know someone in depression, don't leave them there, okay? The interesting thing is suicide, in my view, is not the result of depression. Suicide, in my view, is the result of despair. It's the result of I'm, I feel so bad hmm? and I see no way out. I have no way to come out of this. Now, I see no way out is mainly because we leave them. We don't show up and tell them, hey, I love you. I know, I know it's tough. I know it's bad. I love you. I, I'm not asking you to change, by the way. I just want you to know that I love you. And if we tell people who are in depression, and I actually ran lots of experiments around that, if your sister or your brother or your best friend or whoever, normally what we do when we see them in depression is one, we get angry. Like, why are you so unhappy? We love you. We don't want you to be that way. It's not their choice. Hmm? You know, it, 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 it's it, it's almost it's a it's a make a chemical change in your body that gets you to that place as well. Huh? Uh, we get angry, then we try to 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 preach like, oh, do this, do that, or do that, right? Then we try to compare. I'm like, look at Jackie. Jackie's so happy. Why are you not happy? Hmm? 
None of that works. The only thing that works when you have someone who's in depression is to simply tell them, I absolutely love you. I understand where you are. I understand how painful that is, okay? And I love you and I'm always here, okay? Take your time and I'm always here, I care about you. If you do that long enough, and by the way, you can simulate that. You can simulate that how you text them and say, oh, I passed by this cafe where we had coffee for, you know, for two years ago. It was so much fun. I miss you. I love you. Send. Okay. Any variation of that message actually gets them to start questioning like, why? Why do they love me? Is there anything good about me? Okay, And when you start to give them that message, I promise you, two, three, four weeks later, they'll come and say, you want me to live? Like, I, I really want to be happy. Can you help me out? When they do, we can, t we can show them how to be happy. Okay, Until they do, hmm, we're in a very bad place. And, and if we preach, we make it even worse. Yeah. Have you ever suicide yourself, Mo? Uh, were I ever so? No. No, 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 never, never, never. Uh, mainly because of my religious upbringing, to be honest, okay? But also, so I, I don't drink. I never had uh, drugs in my life, uh, you know. I never escaped uh, in, in a very interesting way. I think I, there was a value to my religious upbringing. I'm not religious in a traditional way at all now. Uh, but there was a value to my, my my religious upbringing that, you know, sort of implants very deeply in my upbringing that I need to be good to others, that I can't take my own life, that I can, you know, I can't cheat, stuff like that, right? I have to be honest and so on, which are good things, by the way. It, it, you know, it's wonderful to, to get those beautiful gold nuggets and live by them. Uh, but then I have to admit, uh, I think somehow, because I never escaped to drinking, never escaped to drugs, never escaped to parties. I never did ayahuasca or any of the cults, as you call them in your documentary. Uh, you know, I, I, basically when you have to sit with the challenge, when you have to sit with the problem, you develop through neuroplasticity, the brain waves that say, look, so I don't have an escape here, so I might as well work on it. Okay, and you know your brain networks start to learn to 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 work on it, and and it, very interestingly, I think my uh, my biggest teaching in this has been in business, believe it or not, not in a spiritual retreat somewhere. When I started to become a people's manager in my early uh, 30s, late 20s, you know, as a people's manager, 90% of your job is to sit in your office while people walk in and complain. That's it. Like, you know, one after one, the, the salespeople come and complain about the legal team and the legal team comes and what complains about the salespeople. It's, you know, that's your life, like a, a, a therapist, really, right? And 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 I, you know, I found a way um, to basically say, so when someone walks in and complains, what do I do with that? Hmm? The first thing is I let them complain. I listen attentively. I show empathy. The second is I say, is there anything that might be a little bit hidden about what you're what you're saying are, is that is part of the truth not in that story are you, you know is, so, is there something good about the legal team have you had good experiences with them that's number two and then number three i simply say so what can we do about it what can we do about it huh? and 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 i you know and that flow chart if you want most of the time uh, works with others and i realize that it works with me too so when my brain starts to complain, I follow a very simple flowchart, three questions. And it's, it's, I think it's one of the more, more famous parts of my third book, That Little Voice in Your Head. Three, three questions. Question one is, what, is it true? Is what my brain telling me true at all? Okay? Because you, know, you could have an argument with, a, with your partner on a Friday, and you're, you know, on Saturday your brain will say he or she doesn't love me anymore. Is that true brain? Right? And if it isn't true, I drop it. If it is true, I ask the second question, which is, what can I do about it? Hmm? And what can I do about it is actually the answer to most unhappiness. Hmm? If something's not working well, like you did, huh? you were going through that difficult phase of your life, and then you stop and you say, okay, this is making me unhappy. It's taking my life away. What am I going to do about it? I'm going to do the six-week uh, you know, change, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. I'm going to do something about it. If there is something you can do about it, do it, and unhappiness goes away and life becomes better. If there isn't, then the third question is what I normally call the Jedi master level of happiness, you know, losing a child like I lost Ali. There is nothing you can do about it. You can't bring it back. You can't, you can't bring him back. You can't fix it in any possible way. So, so when you are faced with something that you cannot change, 
my answer is something I call committed acceptance. Committed acceptance is not a sign of weakness, but it is to accept that life took away my son. I have to accept it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I have to commit, hmm? not just accept and lie down and die, but I have to commit to making my life better despite the, present, the, the presence of that fact. Hmm? So, you know, writing the book, telling his story to the world, starting my, my, uh, my um, organization, One Billion Happy, all of that doesn't bring him back, but it makes life better despite his absence. Mm -hmm. So happiness as well, that people, people tell me you're doing amazing, that's how great you've changed and done this, but part of me walks away and think, fool you, like, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome, but do you ever feel as if, because you have been through dark times when you feel happy, sometimes a negative pops in that you shouldn't be happy, like, how do you get, how do you find that balance then? So it's not you're being selfish. It's not as if your loved ones don't want you to move on and be happy anyway. Like your son who wants you to be as happy as you can be. But some people live on grief forever. <coughs> 10 years, 20 years, the Christmases, birthdays, crying the same shit day in, day out. And they must be banging their head against the fucking wall. It, it, it's sad that people do that. But for people that's maybe watching, that's maybe in that grief stricken, lost somebody 10 years ago, but still reliving that pain, like, what advice would you have for them? Well, I think there is a need for understanding happiness at a very deep level, but let, let's just from, start from a higher level for a second. Uh, life continues to go on. Hmm? Uh, your negative thoughts are not going to make ch life change. So, so, so the, you know, the reality is after my son uh, died, I refused to drink for the first eight hours, nine hours. And then before I collapsed in bed from, you know, exhaustion, I, uh, you know, I had to drink a sip of water. The, the next, you know, four days I didn't eat. And then four days later I started to eat. And, you know, two weeks later, my, myself and my wife, then, uh, you know, we, we made love, right? Your life co goes on. Hmm? Uh, uh, um, the thing is, we refuse to go on in our heads. Hmm? And we refuse to go on in our heads for many, many reasons. I, I, so it could be guilt. It could be uh, an ego. The ego is, I love them, so how can I move on? It could be a, a fear hmm, of like, what happens if I move on? Will I, will I forget them? It could be anything. Hmm? Uh, and, and, and you have to respect that. You know, the, those emotions are not within our control. They are outside our control. Now, let's understand where those emotions come from. And, and I think of all of my work, I think the one that really, really made a difference to the world was the happiness equation in Solve for Happy in my first book. So, so happiness is not as unpredictable as people think it is. It follows a mathematical equation. And the mathematical equation is very straightforward. It's events minus expectations. So any moment in your life you felt unhappy was a moment where the events of life missed your expectations of how life should be. Okay, uh, uh, you know, you, you, I, the example I always give, some people may have heard it before, is rain. Hmm? Rain doesn't make you happy or unhappy. There is no inherent value of happiness in rain. Okay, rain makes you happy if it's your ex boyfriend's wedding, it makes you very unhappy if it's your wedding. The, the comparison is I expect life to be nice to me on my wedding day, and I expect it to be lousy to, to my ex boyfriend on his wedding day. Hmm? Be the event train is compared to those expectations and you end up in a place where you're happy or unhappy. Now, if you understand this, you realize that our unhappiness in that case, by the way, it means that happiness is not what we think it is. Happiness is just that peaceful contentment we, we feel when we're okay with life as it is. It doesn't matter what life is, okay? What matters is that we're okay with it. If, you're ca if you can be okay with life when it's tough, you're going to feel contented and peaceful and calm inside. And that's the feeling of happiness. And many people I know live that way. You could be in Latin America and you, do, you basically barely make your uh, income for the day. Okay? But when you make your income for the day, you're happy for the rest of the day and you're dancing and you're having fun and life is okay. Right? The definition of the happiness equation, happiness is equal to or greater than the difference between the events of your life and your expectations of how life should be, defines unhappiness, which is what matters most. Unhappiness in that case is a survival mechanism. Okay, It's your brain looking at the world around it and saying something in the world as it is today does not ma match my expectations of an optimum way of living. So I need to alert you. 
your brain basically says, I need to make you aware that this is not how life should be because if it isn't how life should be, I don't feel safe, right? And and as a result of that, hmm, uh, that comparison, your brain alerts you in the form of an emotion. It doesn't alert you in the form of uh, a thought because your brain is talking to you all the time and you're not even listening. Hmm? It alerts you in the form of, that, of an emotion. That emotion could be fear, could be regret, could be sadness, whatever that is. Hmm? Interestingly, for most of us, that emotion, as I said, in the, in the flow chart should trigger action. So, you know, when my son died, the action I took is I'm going to write a book, make his people, make the world remember his, what he taught me and his essence, uh, essence, which doesn't bring him back, but it's, it still makes life better after he left. Okay. That action is why I'm sitting in front of you, reasonably happy with my life, probably the happiest uh, I have ever been. Even though I feel the pain of losing my child, I'm still peaceful and calm and contented with the fact that me and him, through what he taught me and through his departure, have made it so far, right? If, uh, 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 that, if that's the case, if that's the case of events minus expectations, then you need to ask yourself, why do we get stuck? I, I was teaching uh, on Soul for Happy before the pandemic. There were 2,000 people in the audience. And then a, a woman comes to me and says, uh, how can you say that events minus expectations? You know, are you saying I should change my events and my expectations to feel happy? You know, happiness is not a choice. What are you talking about? You have no idea what happened to me. And then she paused for a second and said, when I was 17, okay? She was 74 at the time. 57 years later, she was still stuck in the same thought. Same thought. Now, why do we do, I hugged her. I said, I'm so sorry, did, did, did it work? Did it work, right? Because you can be stuck for a day, 57 days or 57 years. Hmm? The real question is, did it work? Did life suddenly come up and tell you, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, um, you know, that this happened to you. I'm going to fix it now because you've been sad for 56 years. Life suddenly realized that, oh, oh, I'm so sorry that was not intended. No, life doesn't respond that way. If, you, if you're if you crying uh, at home that your partner said something hurtful on Friday, okay, that doesn't make your partner aware so that he shows up or she shows up and apologizes. It doesn't, unhappiness has zero impact on the real world. It just tortures you. Why do we do it? Because we're still six years old. We, we, because we never grow beyond the time when we were six years old. We're still kids, okay? There was a utility to unhappiness when you were a child. If the diaper was wet, you cried, okay? And your mommy came or your caretaker came and changed the diaper. There is a utility. There is a utility to unhappiness when you were, you know, four, because when you cried, you grabbed everyone's attention. There was a, a utility to unhappiness when you're six, because when you fell and cried, your mommy hugged you. Okay. And so you stay in that space. It's like, okay, I'm going to stay here forever. And some, wh wh why is someone not coming to hug me? Why is nobody? But by the way, some people actually do come to hug them. So if you, if you stay in that space for a very long time, what happens? People come and say, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. I feel so sorry for you. I love you. I hug you. I tap you on the back. Yeah. Okay? Which is valid, by the way. But wouldn't, it, wouldn't life be so much better if you said to yourself, oh, very bad move, life. I lost my son. It's a very bad move. I, I really didn't like this one. Okay? But I can still get up and live for the remaining years of my life. I mean, it's it's not that I have a choice. Ali is not coming back. It is it. That's it. He is not coming back. Okay? Do I have a choice? Yes, I do. I can live happily or at least in contentment and peace. Hmm? Or I can live angry or I can live in grief or I can live sad or I can be alive but not live alone at, at all. All of these are choices. Mm -hmm. Which of them is the smartest choice? The smartest choice is to do something for yourself go on, do something for them, hmm? because that's really much better than you sitting in a corner and doing nothing at all. Mm -hmm. We talk about artificial intelligence as well. You wrote a book on that. What was that? Scary, Sc scary smart. Yeah. Yes. And you say in the next eight years, there's going to be stuff here that is one billion times smarter than humans. Is that correct? No. So eight, eight, eight years. So 2029. So that's seven years seven now. Years. 
the smartest being on the planet is going to be a machine. Uh, by 2045 is the consensus uh, that machine or those machines in general will be a billion times smarter than us. Could that be a possibility that could wipe out humanity? I don't think so. So, so my, my, I, I write the book around uh, something that I call the three inevitables. So artificial intelligence will happen. There is no way we can stop it. Okay? What is artificial intelligence for people who don't know? Artificial intelligence, so, so around, the, the end, uh, around the end of the last century, we discovered a way of programming machines that was known as deep learning, okay? And deep learning is very different than any other piece of code we ever wrote before. Before we wrote code that said, uh, tap your finger on the table, tap it again, tap it again, tap it again, and the computers just did exactly that. Whatever you told them, they performed exactly the same way like glorified slaves. They just were very, very fast, so that they, they could perform them billions of times, and, and that made them look smart. They were not. Uh, when deep learning happened, we started to tell the machines, figure out what should be done. We don't need to tell you. You figure it out. And, and the first example of that, at least that I was exposed to, was known as the cat paper. Uh, and it was a white paper that Google uh, you know, uh, publicly shared uh, in 2009 uh, about an experiment that we ran at the time where we allowed computers to watch YouTube. We didn't tell them what to do. We just told them, go out, watch YouTube, tell us what you think. Okay? And, uh, you know, those computers... Uh, turned YouTube into frames and looked at the frames and tried to find out what's similar across all of those frames. And then one of them came back and said, hey, uh, I found something. And we looked at what it found and what it found was a cat, okay? It didn't find a cat jumping or a cat sitting. It found what catness was, what being a cat is, okay? The, you know, the fairy uh, uh, entitled uh, you know, um, um, sitting in the sun, uh, jumping, hissing, everything that makes a cat, it could make, the machine could make a, um, a pattern uh, recognition piece of code that says anything that falls within this is a cat, right? Deep learning changed the way technology is beyond repair, beyond return, if you want, or beyond repair. It's also probably an, a correct word. Because now, when a machine recommends a video for you on Instagram, no human has any clue how it did it, okay? It, uh, you know, we have a, a, a top idea that it's trying to show you what others liked so that you, uh, you know, the, so that you click on it or stay there. Hmm? But nobody actually knows because it also includes into consideration that you clicked on other videos that others clicked uh, on as well and that you are a, you know, a man and that you have a podcast and that you, you know, co are connected to me on Instagram somehow and that we message a few time. And there is so a whole suite of things that gets the machine to make that choice. None of them hmm, is understood by a human. So basically what we've created now is we've created the ability for machines to create their own intelligence. And we've also given them autonomy to implement that in the real world. And we've also uh, sort of relinquished, we give, we've given them the, 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 the key to the gate uh, so that they now are in charge, basically. Could these machines be conditioning us right now with our phones, how we think and feel? Are they that intelligent? They are way more intelligent. So, so most people don't agree when I tell them that. But remember, I built a lot of that stuff when I was at Google. So, so those are, machines are sentient in every possible way. Uh, even though they are based on silicon, uh, they are a digital form of intelligence. We're based on carbon and we're a biological form of intelligence. Intelligence in itself is non-physical. Intelligence is one of those things that we don't understand. We, we think it happens in our brain, okay? But to, what it actually is, I mean, I can't give you something and say, okay, he, this is intelligence, right? Um, now, as I said, those machines are born at a point in time, they um, uh, procreate, so they create copies of, them, of themselves to expand their intelligence. They develop their own intelligence 
uh, and the methods they use to, to develop that intelligence through trial and error and pattern recognition, they take, uh, they take that intelligence and they have agency in the world. They can actually affect our decisions either through robotics or mind control. And they actually are conscious, more conscious than humanity. I'll come back to that in a second. They're emotional more emotional than humanity, I'll come back to that in a second. They're creative, more creative than humanity, I come back, that, back to that in a second, but they're also mortal. So you can switch one of them off. And so when you have a machine that is intelligent, we are a, an intelligent machine, even though humans don't you know, want to deny that fact. We are a machine in every possible way, and that machine breaks like a car breaks, okay? Just a biological machine that we got used to but if your blood doesn't pump the proper way tomorrow, you'll need a plumber. We we'll call it a heart surgeon. Okay, and 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 uh, and so those machines. Let's go into the depth of the reality. The depth of reality is they are more creative than us. Why? Because if you have a definition of what creativity is, creativity is find a solution to a problem, or create something that hasn't been created before. Find a solution to a problem in a way that has not been devised before or create something new that hasn't been created before, okay? Now, how do humans do that? It appears to be instinctive, but no, if you're, the, the, the creative people will look at a, you know, the seven notes of music or whatever and say, I can, I can rearrange those in ways that are different than what has been done before and that's creativity. The machines have infinite ability to, to actually find out everything that's been done before because it's all on the internet, all right? And they have infinite ability to devise solutions because they're more intelligent than us. And so combine those two and you'll end up with machines that are much more creative. They'll come up with more solutions. They'll be aware of which are creative and which are not, and they'll devise the creative ones. Now, we don't wanna admit that, but the reality is uh, there are lots of artworks out there in the, on the internet today that are fully created by a machine that would blow you away and that are much more creative than humanity. That's one. Second is they're more conscious than us, and most people don't understand that. Again, consciousness is not a physical thing I can hand you, uh, but if you, you know, and there are lots of spiritual debates about what consciousness is and scientific debates about what, the, what they call the hard problem of consciousness, humanity's uh, ego trying to, to, you know, to, to magnify the problem. But the reality is consciousness is, is, a, is a state of awareness of what's inside you and, 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 around, and around you, right? So if you're able to identify, to self-identify, to become conscious of your presence and, the con and become conscious of what's around you and, have, and make sense of those relationships of you and me being there and how we, do, you know, we communicate and how I feel and so on and so forth, that's the form of consciousness we're talking about. And the machines are much more conscious than you and I. They're aware of everything, including this conversation. Okay, they're aware of my character probably more than I am because of all of the posts and cameras that are, you know, um, 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 pointed at me all, all day in the streets and in studios. They are aware of the weather in Beijing and the pollution level in San Francisco. They are aware of all of the breaking news. They're aware of all of the history of humanity as documented on the internet. They're aware of so much more than us. And so they're going to be more conscious than us the one that kills people when I talk about it and a lot of people go like, why did you tell me this? I was happier when I didn't know is, is they're more emotional than us, okay? And, and that's very simple because once again, other than unconditional love, which doesn't have an emotion, every other emotion has, uh, sorry, which doesn't have an equation to describe it, every other emotion has an, an equation to describe it. Every other emotion is highly predictable. Fear is, I suspect that a moment in the future is less safe than this current moment, okay? Anxiety is, I suspect that despite having a threat coming approaching me from the future, I don't have the capability, or I suspect I don't have the capability to deal with it. Panic is, this you know, moment in the future is imminent, it's very near. And each one of those is a logical. Our emotions are, are triggered first by physiology, but within 90 seconds by logic. Hmm? And that logic basically is available within the machines. If a tidal wave is approaching a data center, the machine will say, I'm going to die. Okay? And it will do something about it. Now, why am I saying all of this? Because the approach of computer science to deal with the upcoming singularity. Singularity is what we describe the future as computer scientists. It's basically a horizon, an event horizon beyond which we don't know what's going to happen. Your question was, is it going to be a, a utopia or a dystopia? Nobody can tell you. 
okay? Uh, but we can tell you that it's going to be very different. It's going to be a singularity. It's going to be a very different playground with very different game rules than what we've known before. And accordingly, nobody knows if it's going to end up with a utopia or a dystopia, but we know that we can influence it so that it goes in one of those two directions. Now, my analysis and my work, and, and uh, please understand, I worked at, you know, at Google and at Google X uh, for years, so I know in, in artificial intelligence from the inside out. Um, uh, the answer in the computer science space and in the government space and in the business space is we're going to control them, okay? We're going to create this genie and keep it in a bottle. Hmm? Good luck. So you can keep a genie in a bottle, as long as you're more intelligent than the genie. If the, in, if the genie is more intelligent than you, it will come out of the bottle and they will be a billion times smarter than us. And as you can see today on the internet, despite all of our efforts to, you know, to create a safe internet for everyone, the truth is that the smartest hacker will always find a way through our defenses. So if the smartest hacker is a billion times smarter than us, and by the way, if the smartest hacker is also a machine, Hmm? they will find a way not to be controlled. What's the risks? Interesting question. So I don't believe we're going to ever see any of the science fiction uh, scenarios like, you know, Terminator, Terminator or Robocop or, you know. Uh, but it's a possibility? Uh, not at all. I, I believe that this is a zero possibility. Okay. My, my view is that the machines will go through three stages. There is stage one, which is where we are right now, which is uh, uh, machines in their infancy. I compare them to a one and a half year old child where we humans can influence them as their parents. Because remember, hmm, uh, something that is uh, 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 emotional, conscious, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, creative and evolving and so on, sentient in every way, should be influenced like, you know, family can't influence Superman. There's nothing wrong with, with superpower, huh? having an infant child come to our planet and teach that child to be, to protect and serve. And we have Superman. Superman is a good thing, right? If we teach that child to become, uh, you know, to steal for us and to kill our enemies and, 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 uh, you know, we are going to end up with, with a supervillain. Hmm? And the machines that are in their infancy now are learning from you and I and everyone listening. They're not learning from the programmer. They're not learning from the business owner. They're not learning. No programmer is teaching the Instagram uh, uh, um, uh, recommendation engine what to recommend to you. You are. You are telling it, I like stupid videos uh, of people lip syncing. And then the machines are starting to make up their mind that humanity is so silly, we should show them more and more lip syncing. And so more humans are creating lip syncing videos. And as a result, we're, you know, syncing in lip syncing. Okay. Now, because of that, you and I can teach the future when the machines are infants, which leads us to phase two of the evolution of AI. Phase two of the evolution of AI, in my assessment, is 10 to 15 years away which is their teenage stage, okay? If we show them the wrong ethics, the wrong values as parents, hmm, I tend to believe that as they get into this stage, they'll be angry teenagers that will apply the same ethics that we applied on them to us, okay? Which is a very bad place to be. Um, having said that, I don't believe that this stage will last at all. Why? Because of something that we call the law of accelerating returns. The law of accelerating returns is what you saw with computers and phones and so on, where the power of computers double every 18 months, uh, you know, uh, exponentially forever. Hmm? Uh, and, and with AI, and especially with the evidence of quantum computing and so on and so forth, this will be double exponential. It will be very, very, very fast. So the difference, let, let me give you an example. Uh, if you take something like um, AlphaGo, which is the world champion in a game called Go, hmm? AlphaGo could learn within hours of playtime how to become the world champion. That's how fast they can become. And, and so my at assessment is that while by 2029 the machines will be smarter, or at least one machine will be smarter than any human, okay, uh, they will co very quickly surpass that and surpass human intelligence infinitely more. Now, interestingly, humanity has never understood that we're actually not the smartest being on the planet. 
Okay, the smartest being on the planet, which is the the being that has been battling us for quite some time now, is life itself. Life is smarter than humanity. Why? Because humanity creates from scarcity. Life creates from abundance. It's quite interesting when you really think about it. Huh? For us to feel safe, we want to kill the tigers. For life to make life prosper, they don't kill the tigers. They have more tigers and more gazelles, okay, and more uh, humans and more poop and more trees and more apples and more everything. And yes, that means that the tigers will eat some gazelles, but they will eat the weakest gazelles anyway, and life will be fine, right? My belief is that AI will very quickly match that kind of intelligence where they will not see a need to fight against humanity hmm? because creating from abundance wants humanity to, to be part of the change, hmm? the chain, right? We, we are the only being that is stupid enough to eradicate other species. Hmm? And the smarter ones of us know that this is the wrong thing to do. It's not good for us or anyone else. The machines will find that out very quickly. They'll say, we want to keep humans, but we want to, you know, limit their lifestyle a little bit. You, you know, you, you can't really, if you want to surf, you can't fly all the way to Australia to surf and destroy the planet in the process. And so accordingly, they'll either say, no more surfing in Australia, surfing Kent or wherever, I don't know where you guys surf here in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but or, or they will say I'll invent uh, I'll help you invent a, uh, an aeroplane that doesn't destroy the planet, right? Either way, I think what where we will end up is what I what I call the fourth inevitable, which is we will end up in a place where the machines will marginalize our current lifestyle and offer us a lifestyle that's more analogous to what we had before the industrial revolution which basically, again, it may be not the right time to discuss it, but with a bit of understanding of nanophysics where you can create things by changing the molecular, molecular uh, um, design of something so you can take some air and turn it into gold if you want, right? Uh, and with a bit of uh, uh, additional intelligence that allows you to do that at scale, I think humanity will end up in a place where we can walk to a tree and pick a, an apple and walk to another tree and pick an iPhone, okay? And none of that will be harmful to the planet. None of that will be... Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, against humanity in any way, because like life, I think the machines will want to create an abundance. The only challenge we have is between now, their infancy, and then their adulthood, there is that angry teenage stage. And I think that angry teenage stage is, stands to be 15 years from 15 years from now. And it's a stage that we can deal with right now by being the best version of ourselves. If enough humans, I say, my calculation is if 1% if of humanity can show what it's like to be human, mm -hmm. okay, the machines will look at those 1% online and say, oh, oh, okay, daddy is Mo, it's not Putin, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Putin makes a choice to kill people, but look at how many billions around the world are resenting the killing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if the machines realize that, they would realize that humanity doesn't approve of this, that humanity believes that we're pro-life, that humanity wants good for others, and that we're stupid every now and then like bad kids, but, but that at the core, we want happiness, we want compassion, we want love for each other, and that we're okay. Yeah, but say you get a faulty one, you say it's got conscience. What if it looks at humanity and thinks this ain't working, and then decides they may as well just wipe it out because who says that it's not then putting things in place because humans are easily manipulated I believe look at people who watch the news you watch that long enough you're going to be so depressed so if they've got more intelligence then how, how do we know they're not putting things in place in our phone to then brainwash us to a certain degree and if they can't if they then think these humans it ain't working here is there a possibility that do, they, do you think humans are not working? I ask you that question openly. Yeah, I think... Do you think we're a bad species? I don't think we're a bad species. I think we're divided. It's divide and conquer, religion, race, all the other stuff. Like I believe we all live under the same roof. We all breathe the same air. I believe if we work together, the world would be a beautiful place. I believe Absolutely. it would be a happy place. I think when you're born, you're told certain beliefs, certain religions, and that's okay. Everybody sees the world differently. But I think we're at a crossroads... I'm hoping it's a mass awakening, but people waking up and we see the world. Even different. without the awakening. Yeah. E even without the awakening, I will tell you openly, I mm -hmm. think humanity is a divine species. Yeah. We're, we're incredible. Like, Amazing, yeah. If, if, you've, if you've ever fallen in love, you know. Mm -hmm. You know that this is unbelievable, that, that species is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where if, if you've, you know, the, 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 re the problem we have with humanity today, James, is not that we're bad. 
It's that we're incented to show the bad sides of us. Okay, so so if you if you're following a cult or a religion or you know some kind of 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 someone that tells you to hate, hmm, your your uh, your attempt is to show that hate because that makes you fit in. Uh, by the way, um, I'm not saying that against anyone who believes in religion. I'm religious myself, but you know it, the the division is. If you don't like the religious people, then that's a religion as well, okay? And and that basically is incentive for you to show the bad side of you, the hate side of you, not the love side of you, the the exclusion side of you, not the exclu- the inclusion side of you. And that's m- highly magnified in the modern world by the media. So the mainstream media is highly incented to show the negative because of, of our brain's negativity bias. The, 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 you know, they broadcast violence because it makes people stick to their TVs and screens, right? Uh, you know, on social media, we broadcast toxic po- toxic positivity because, you know, this is the way for us to say, look at me, I'm amazing, and it makes us fit in. Hmm? Mm-hmm. But the reality is underneath all of this, the truth is we're an amazing species. I'll give you an example. On my podcast on Slow Mo, uh, one of my favorite guests ever was Edith Ager. Edith is a 93-year-old probably 94 now, uh, a Holocaust survivor, okay? Uh, I cried, like I cried, I wept like a baby when I was listening to that woman. She is an angel, okay? Tells you the story of the Holocaust from her point of view. And, you know, how she needed to... uh, to, to help her sisters, as she, as she called them, and remind and brush their hairs and tell them that they're beautiful. And, you know, when she used to be a ballerina, so she would entertain the general and then bring a piece of bread and split, split it between them. And how at the end, when they were doing the death march, they carried her so that she doesn't fall, so that she doesn't get killed. And, and it, when you hear that story from Edith, you go like, oh my God, oh my God, humans are amazing. Hmm? You hear it from the story of history and what Hitler did, and you say we're scum. Hmm? But that the question that you really need to ask yourself is, how many Hitlers are out there? And how many Ediths? I asked her at the end of the conversation, I said, Edith, so, so she went back to, to, uh, to Auschwitz. Hmm? And I said, why did you do this? And she said, I wanted to reconcile and you know tell the world that I don't hate anyone. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, if I was born German and I was tell, told, uh, uh, you know, and now Germany and, and tomorrow the world, I may have probably acted like them as well, right? That kind of forgiveness, that kind of in, more enormous beauty of soul and spirit of heart, hmm? that's what humans are about. That's what we are, okay? We, however, have a negativity bias that makes us look different. Now, I'm encouraging people, I'm saying, if 1% of us show who we are, hmm, smile at people in the tube, uh, you know, talk to others, help the old lady, get up from your seat when someone walks in this, in, 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 into the tube and let them sit down, you know, sp- post, post something positive online instead of just ranting and, and, and fighting with anyone. Yeah, not everyone is going to do this. Um, don't expect to, uh, that I will re, uh, raise humanity. Hmm? But if 1% does this, just like I may have in, you know, gotten you to now think and say, yeah, actually humanity is not that bad. If we instill that doubt in the minds of the machines, the machines will realize, oh my God, amazing species. Deluded, Stupid in so many ways, right? <laughs> but, but, I agree with that one. Yeah, but, but mm-hmm. uh, deep inside, honestly, I, I'll, I'll say this again. Hmm? Some people kill. There was that school shooting recently. Mm-hmm. Yes, a, a, a horrible person does that. But how many of us resent it? How many of us say this is wrong? How many of us disapprove? That's the truth of humanity. How many of us, you know, how many of us hit our partner on the head with a with a sharp device last night? And how many of us kissed and made love? Okay. And if you really take the majority of humanity, we're okay. We're not that horrible after all. We're under pressure. We have egos. We are uninformed. We're conditioned. We have traumas. But deep inside, we're all okay. Yeah, I think so. I think they, everybody's got goodness in them, sense of goodness. Absolutely. You talk about the machines and how do we know, though, that they're not and they're going to be in full control of... Is it a positive, what they're doing, or is it a negative? And why were they built in the first place? Sorry, I'm just talking yeah. about food, but why were they built? 
ego. Ego and greed. I think the worst humani- the, the worst innovation humanity has ever invented is something called capitalism. Okay, which is so interesting because capitalism is teaching us to magnif- to ma- to maximize for something that doesn't exist. So it's so stupid. Money does not exist. People don't understand that. It's all printed and inflationary, and it's you know it's just it doesn't exist. And we all spend lifetimes chasing it. And yeah, and so capitalism is telling us, um, make more of it. And so how do you make more of it? You continue to compete. And, you know, in, in Scary Smart, I call that the first inevitable, the first inevitable. So, so uh, Elon Musk uh, was interviewed and he said, mark my words, artificial intelligence is more threatening to humanity than nuclear weapons. Okay. Why is it then that we don't stop it like we stopped nuclear weapons? Because of capitalism, because we've created a prisoner's dilemma as a, as a capitalist society that basically says if Google are, develops artificial intelligence, Facebook needs to develop artificial intelligence. If uh, you know uh, China develops artificial intelligence, then America has to develop artificial intelligence. So there is no stopping us. We're caught in that inevitable. That's why we are, uh, you know, the first inevitable is artificial intelligence will happen. There's no way out of it. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Honestly, and I please don't judge me, but the reason you and I have those this sophisticated equipment and that we can record any uh, conversation that you know so many people hopefully will benefit from is because of humanity's intelligence. But we're stupid. We really are. The, the, all of the challenges that we create as humans are because of our limited intelligence. You know, yes, it's amazing, an amazing innovation to create an aeroplane, but it's so stupid to burn the fly the 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 the, the, the planet on in the process. It's it's incredible that I can walk into a Sainsbury's or a Waitrose around the corner and get berries, uh, you know, that have been picked fifty kilometers away. It's absolutely stupid to wrap it in single-use plastic that's going to destroy the planet. Okay, now our intelligence gets us far further. Our stupidity is destroying us. More intelligence is not a bad thing. Because if we're more intelligent, we wouldn't do the stupidity that we're doing here. So I foresee a scenario hmm, where we're going to have to hand over to AI. There's no way about it, again, because of the first inevitable. Huh? If China creates a very intelligent machine that is going to, to uh, be in charge of their uh, weaponry arsenal, which they will eventually create a machine that is smarter than a human to be in charge of their defense system, America will have to hand over their defense systems to machines because no human can match the intelligence of that machine. Okay, so we're going to hand over. I, I can guarantee you this is going to happen. It's inevitable. Now, when that happens, I'm very optimistic because we are stupid. I can guarantee you that those two machines will be against each other and say, yeah, it's really easy. The way to resolve this doesn't require us to kill anyone at all. Okay, the, you know, that's actually the, the t- t- pure, true intelligence, true human intelligence without ego is to not kill anyone at all. You can resolve your issues, hopefully with a tiny bit more feminine, huh, with a conversation. Mm-hmm. Hmm? And, and, the, and the interesting thing is that we as humans are stuck in all of those fights and debates and greed and, you know, maximizing for, for not something that doesn't exist, as I say, capitalism, when in reality, a little more intelligence if you and I sit together and go like, can we solve this problem? Yeah. Yeah. We can. But it's a greed that's poison men's souls. Who says the machines won't become greedy? You don't, you, you become greedy when you think out of a point of view of scarcity. Okay? So, so, so the, the, the scarcity is for me to be able to, uh, to be richer, you have to be poorer. Okay? That's stupid. That's absolutely stupid. Forms of intelligence that create better than humans hmm, believe that for me to be richer, it's better for you to be richer too. As a matter of fact, this is economic theory. Hmm? If you remember those times when George W. Bush during the economic crisis, was it 2008? He comes out to America and says, if you want to save the economy, keep spending. Okay, that's economic theory. That's as stupid as it sounds, honestly, 
Hmm? It is economic theory because if you keep spending, then we can keep making and then people can go to work and then they can get money and then they can keep spending and so on. It's stupid economic theory, but the reality is abundance is the way forward. The abundance is if I can create, uh, you know, if I can plant apples on top of your building, hmm, you won't need to ship apples from New Zealand. And would that mean that the guys in New Zealand, the economy will go down? Yeah, there will be a reset in our economy in general, but definitely you don't need to be greedy for everything to become better. As a matter of fact, the only way for everything to become better is to, is to, is to create uh, n zero competition. There is, mm. there is no need for me to hit you for me to succeed. If you could take one way, thing away from this planet, what would you take away? Our hyper-masculinity for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I know you've got a dinner book, so just a couple more questions. Like, how many books have you wrote more? I published three. I've written five, and hopefully, uh, I'm I'm I've become an addict, so I'm writing. <laughs> Is your books nice writing books therapy for you, Mo? Hmm? Is writing books your therapy? It definitely is my way of reflection. So I actually, interesting that you ask this question. I don't write to, to publish. Actually, there are many things I wrote that I didn't publish. I write for me to be honest to me. Uh, because if I write, if I, if I think about a topic, I can sort of lie to me. Hmm? Tell me that this is true or whatever is conditioned in me is, is, is accurate. When I know that I'm going to put it in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, then I start to be a lot more honest with myself. Hmm? I actually put in the research a little deeper. For example, uh, that book that's called Finding Love. Uh, I, this is the third time I write it. And that was mainly because when I wrote it the first time, it was written from the point of view of a straight male. Okay. And, and then suddenly, like four chapters in, I realized that everything that applies to me applies to everyone else. Okay. L love is the same. Relationship is the same. Lust is the same. Yeah. The object of our love might be different, but it doesn't make any difference. Okay. So, and so I wrote it that way. And then I, I, I basically realized halfway through again that no, but hold on. There is that, you know, feminine and masculine polarity. It's not male and female. It's not man and woman. It's not straight and gay. It's not how your gender identity. But there is the the, the polarity of man and of feminine and masculine, and that polarity of feminine and masculine actually affects our decisions. You know what the feminine is looking for in a relationship, whether you're man or woman, straight or gay. You can be feminine. What the feminine is looking for is different than what the masculine is looking for. And so I, I write it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think that that process of writing is for me to figure out my relationship, uh, 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 you know, path. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'm not writing it for anyone else. Everyone says, oh my God, that's amazing. That could really help us so much if, you, if we look at it from that way. But yes, I hope it will help a million people, but I'm writing it for me to figure out something that I struggled with. Uh, you know, for years. Yeah. Going forward for the future, brother, what's your plans? My my current commitment is something I call flow. So I've, uh, I, I work on myself in very, very long development plan. So I, I work on, uh, I'm working entirely for the last four and five, five, six years now, I'm working entirely on empowering my feminine side. And uh, the entry point to that has, for me, has been the idea of empowering my f ability to more pl be more playful, be more in flow with life, be more in acceptance with life, be more one with life, if you want. And so it, this is the, my second year of flow. So every year I dedicate to a theme that I will focus on, uh, 2021 and 2022, both are for flow. And I believe that this will continue, I think, until I feel that I got it. I feel, remember, I am a retired control freak. I'm a mathematician, a software developer, a business executive. Doesn't get worse than that, okay? <laughs> yeah, and so, and so to, be able to, to be able to leave that behind and be a lot more in flow is taking me uh, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. For people watching that's maybe stuck in the struggle just now more, what advice would you have for them? Uh, say, say again? For people that's maybe in the struggle just now in life, maybe mm -hmm. battling, just can't be asked doing anything depressed. Like, what advice would you have for them? Uh, hug yourself. If you feel if you're if you're unhappy, it's okay. Absolutely okay. Uh, if you're happy, uh, or if you're interested to be happy and unable to get there, it's absolutely okay. Right. The 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 biggest 
thing we deprived ourselves of in the modern world is the ability to feel. It's, you know, it's okay to feel. We all feel, and including the people that uh, make it look like they're, you know, macho and un, uh, unbreakable, everyone feels. Hmm? When we feel and when we acknowledge and when we're aware of what we're feeling and when we embrace our feeling, embrace it, like celebrate it really, is the first step to saying, okay, all right, I understand now. So what I'm feeling here is anger. Again, one of my favorite guests on Slow Mo was uh, um, Arun Gandhi, who is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, who wrote a book called The, uh, the Gift of Anger. And I asked him, I said, how can anger be a gift? And he said, anger is an energy, like any other energy. You can stand up and punch someone in the face, or you can stand up and make a speech that changes the world. It's the same energy, right? And I think if we can acknowledge that, if we can acknowledge that emotions are good for us, that it's okay to feel, and then one, take the right action, direct that energy properly, okay? And maybe two, uh, recharge the energy. So, you know, like I, 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 I did a post on Instagram recently saying, yeah, we all, we're all feeling angry about what's happening in Ukraine, but what good is the anger giving to people in Ukraine? Like, how is it changing their life in any way? Hmm? The same event which is triggering your anger can also trigger compassion, can also trigger kindness, can also recharge your emotions in ways that lead you to do things that are good for you and for, for others. So, you know, maybe we can do that. And, I, and I'll say openly, for everyone who's feeling unhappy today, that unhappiness is like fitness, okay? If you work on it, you will become happier. You know, just like when you go to the gym and you, uh, you know, uh, uh, rip your muscles, then replenish and then rest, you know, you grow muscles. This is the cycle and it's well known hmm? in our minds and in our being. It's called neuroplasticity. If you, if you work on your happiness, you will become happier. It's as simple as that. Hmm? Go to the happiness gym. Happiness gym basically means spend time with happy people, uh, read about the topic, listen to this podcast one more time, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, watch a documentary, uh, whatever. Mm? Invest in your happiness for show, you know, keep a gratitude journal, whatever it is that you do. And, and it's like fitness because if you do that three to four times a week, like going to the gym, you will eventually become happier. It's as predictable as an equation as I explained that. And that's all I ask people to do. I ask people to, Acknowledge what you feel. It's okay to feel whatever it is that you feel. Acknowledge where you want to be because it's you know definitely better to be uh, happy as, as in peaceful and calm and contented that in, than it is to be grumpy and unhappy. Okay? And plot a path and take your time. Go to the happiness gym every day and talk about that topic. It's like, I'm unhappy because I'm grieving. Study grief. Listen to people who have gone through it and, and succeeded. Um, one, one of them is going to give you a breakthrough. You're unhappy because you're in a relationship issue. Let's study relationships. Just spend time, talk to others. Mm -hmm. Where can people buy your books more and where can they watch our podcast? So books are everywhere. So any, anywhere in uh, you know your bookshop or uh, on, online. So Solve for Happy was the first one, probably the most recommended uh, I love it because it has my personal story and a part of my soul in it, really. Uh, then Scary Smart about artificial intelligence and the future of humanity and that little voice in your head about training your uh, your uh, brain to work for you. Uh, my podcast is called, called Slow Mo, S-L-O-M-O. -O, and it's definitely the most joyful thing that I do. I know you feel the same way. I get amazing kid, uh, guests that are so incredibly wise and they share their experiences and at, at a slightly slower pace than the typical pace of the modern world, which I think is really making a difference. Uh, and uh, and then uh, I'm available if people want to find me on Instagram or underscore Gaudet and I attempt very, very hard, even though it's almost impossible to answer every message that I get. So if anyone has a question, send it my way or if you just want to say hi, that would be wonderful. For coming on today, brother, and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Oh, I wish you nothing but success in the future, no doubt. I've got a feeling we're going to do stuff in the future. But again, fascinating story for making the changes. Proud of you. Look forward to seeing what you're doing in the future. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Uh, it's a joy, by the way, that you and I got in touch. It's part of that flow. You texted me and I was like, yep. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's then definitely been a wonderful encounter and I'm very grateful for what you do to the world. Thank, thank you. you God thank bless you so you. much. Take yeah, care. Thank you.